Hi, today in Applied Calculus we're going to learn about limits. Limits is a topic you've probably never seen even in your pre-calculus course. So we're going to look at this definition. It's going to look a little bit foreign, but I promise we'll break it down and make more sense of it. So the definition is, as x approaches a, so it's um, important to notice that a is going to be an x value, the limit of f of x is l. So the answer to a limit is L, meaning L is going to be a Y value. And this is the formal notation for it. So the limit as X approaches A of F of X equals L. So as X approaches A, the limit of F of X is L. If all values of F of X are close to L for all values of X, that are close to but not equal to A. So these words close are incredibly important because what you did already do in pre-calculus was function values. And this is different than that. This is not talking about when X equals A. This is talking about when X is close to A. It's what's happening as you approach that X value of A. So what we're actually going to do is just be tracing the graph and trying to decide as x gets closer and closer to the value of a, what is y getting closer to? So let's take a look. So first we need to break down that notation. It says the limit as x approaches a. That is actually the notation for um, a, the value that we're approaching, being approached from both sides. And so if instead we mean to just be approaching from one side or the other, we have notation for that. So this little superscript of a plus means that you are approaching from the right, and this little superscript of a minus means you are approaching from the left. So we do need to be really careful that those superscripts are just notation. They do not actually change the value of A. Um, they are just notation for left and right. And where does that notation come from? It comes from the number line. So on a number line, the positives are to the right of zero and the negatives are to the left of zero. So that's where that notation comes from. So we need to check from the left and from the right because in order for a limit to exist, both of the limits have to exist um, and be the same. So here's the formal definition um, of that, the theorem. It says, as x approaches a, the limit of f of x is L, so the answer is L, if the limit from the left exists and the limit from the right exists and they are equal. They're the same thing. So we're actually going to have a hidden three-step problem anytime we're asked for the regular limit without a superscript on it. So this notation means from the left and from the right. And we have to go and check from the left, check from the right, and verify that those equal each other. Right. So we're going to look at our first example, and we're going to start by using a table of values, and then we're going to try to wean ourselves off of having to use a table of values and get to where we can just look at this graph and trace it, and I promise you once you've practiced, these problems become quite quick, actually. So a lot of our best examples for limit problems are piecewise functions, right, where um, it's a function defined and one piece of the function is used for certain x values and another piece of the function is used for other x values. So for this function we use x plus 4 um, for any x that is less than 1 and we use negative x plus 3 for any x that is greater than or equal to 1. So the problem says find the limit as x approaches 1 of g of x. But this is actually a hidden three-part question because of the theorem that we just read. So to do that, we first have to find the limit from the left, the, ne the negative superscript means left, um, and from the right, the positive superscript, and then check that they're equal before we can really answer this question. So you can see that through the tables, I've broken it down that way for us. So if we're plugging values into um, these functions, we're, we want to be close to negative or close to positive one, but not at one. And so if we're close to 1 but not at 1, we're at values like 0 and then getting closer like 0.5 and getting closer still 0.9 and so on. 
So if I'm plugging a value of x equals 0 into the function, I have to decide which piece to use. And x equals 0 is less than 1, and so it qualifies for that part. So we would use x plus 4 for um, evaluating x equals 0. And so if I plug 0 in for x into x plus 4, I get 4. Now I want to be getting closer and closer to 1, so now I'm going to use a value like 0.5. Well, 0.5 is still less than 1, and we're still using the x plus 4 function, so all I'm doing is 0.5 plus 4, and I get 4.5. And I'm going to keep doing this, and if you notice, all of these values are less than 1, and so they all qualify for x plus 4, and so I'm simply replacing x with those values in the function. So I'm going to get 4.9, 4 4.99, and 4.999. So what we want to see is as x is getting closer and closer to 1 from the left of 1, all right, so at this point we're doing from the left, what are our y's getting close to? And if you look at these values, you can see that they're getting closer and closer to a value of 5. And so that's how we can use a table to determine this. But again, I'm going to use a table for a few examples but we don't want to have to use it for all the examples. And so I want to also show you what's happening graphically. So graphically, if we are um, on our function tracing as our x's get closer and closer to 1 from the left, we're trying to see what, what um, y is getting close to. So we do want to start close, especially for using a table of values, but what's really happening is that we are literally tracing the function and letting our x's get closer and closer to 1. So you can see we started here at 0. So as my x's get closer and closer to 1 from x's that are less than 1 to the left of 1, what is my y approaching? And my y is approaching 5. And so you can see that graphically, and we want to get to where we don't have to use the table. So I'm literally tracing the function and saying as, gets, as x gets closer and closer to 1, what is y getting closer to? Now, I don't know if you can see it as well here, but this was actually an open circle. And we know from pre-calculus that an open circle means the function's not defined there, versus this was a closed circle, and so the function is defined there. But a limit talks about close to a point, not at a point. So we don't care that that circle was open and that um, there is no y value there. What we care about is simply what are we getting close to. And as I trace that function, as x gets closer and closer to 1 from the left of 1, y is clearly heading towards 5. I don't care that it never gets there. It's heading towards 5. So now let's check from the other side. So now we would check the limit from the right. So we're going to be coming from the right of 1 and getting closer and closer to an x value of 1 to see what y is doing. So if we are coming from the right, we would want to use, we want to be close to the value. Um, so we want to use numbers that are close to 1 but greater than 1. Because on a number line, if you're to the right of an x of 1, then you are greater than 1. So I want to use numbers like 2, 1.5, and then get closer and closer to 1 as we go. So if I'm plugging a number like 2 into my function, I have to decide which piece to use. Well, 2 is greater than 1. And so for all of these numbers, which are all greater than 1, we are going to be using negative x plus 3. And so once you decide what number, um, which part of the function these numbers qualify for, you're simply plugging them in. And so we'll have negative 2 plus 3 is 1, negative 1 1.5 plus 3 is 1.5, negative 1.1 1 .1 plus 3 is 1.9, and as I keep plugging these in, I'm going to get, so now we got 1.999, and then 1.9999. And so as my x's get closer and closer to a value of 1, what are my y's getting close to? And if you look at that table, you can see that those y's are getting closer and closer to a value of 2. So whereas our limit from the left was 5, because what we saw happening in that table 
our limit from the right is 2. And if we match that up with our image here, we are literally going to trace our graph starting where x is our greater than 1, and we're going to get closer and closer. So this is where we actually started with our table, and we're going to get closer and closer to a value of 1 from x's that are greater than 1, and we're simply asking what is y getting close to, and y is clearly getting close to 2. And so you can see it with the table, you can see it with the graph, um, and again, obviously, it would be nice if we could get to where we could just trace it and see it. So that's all we're really doing. Doesn't matter if it's an open or closed circle. This one was a closed circle, but it doesn't matter. It's just what is y getting close to. So only now can we actually answer the question, the limit as x approaches 1 of the original function, because our theorem said we had to check from the left, from the right, and then see if they're equal. And so what if they're not equal? Because they're not. Um, from the left it was 5, from the right it was 2. So if they're not equal, we say that the limit does not exist. So DNE stands for does not exist. But we'll make sure that we see an example where the limit does exist. So I actually have the same function here. We're simply looking at a different x value. So that's why this notation is really important the limit as x approaches something of something. We really need to say all of that because what function we're tracing matters, and we'll change our answer obviously, and which x value we're getting close to matters and is going to change our answer as you'll see here because I'm keeping my function the same, um, but I'm changing what x value I'm approaching there. So same function. Um, this time we're approaching 4, but to answer the limit as x approaches 4 without any superscripts, meaning from both sides, we have to first check from the left, from the right, and then see if they are equal. So we've got the same setup here, and um, I know that if we're tracing our graph, we could start all the way over here to be left of 4, and that's fine, but you have to keep going until you get close to 4. So if the graph jumps, you have to jump too and keep going until you get close to 4. So since I'm coming um, from the left of 4 but close to 4, I'm going to start about a unit away, which is what you saw me do last time as well. So if I'm using numbers that are to the left of 4 but close to 4, like 3, 3.5, 3.9, 3.99, all of those qualify for which part, right? We have to decide which part we're using. But all of those numbers, because they are close to 4, but to the left of 4, they all fall in this category. They're all greater than 1. And so when I'm actually plugging these specific values in, I'm going to use negative x plus 3. And once I decide which part I'm using, I simply plug in. So if I plug in 3, I'm just going to get 0. Then I'm doing negative 3.5 plus 3, so that's negative 0.5. And then um, negative 0.9, negative 0.99. All right, so I am plugging numbers that are to the left of 4, but getting closer and closer and closer to 4 in. And as those numbers get closer and closer to 4, uh, my y's are getting closer and closer to negative 1. So let's check that graphically. So again, I'm starting to the left of an x value of 4. I can start all the way over here, and that is fine. But when the graph jumps, I jump too. So now we're actually getting close to 4. And as x gets closer and closer to 4, what is y getting close to? And notice that we are there at a value of negative 1. And that's exactly what we saw with our table as well. So we could just trace it and say, oh, it's heading towards negative 1, and we're done with the problem. Now we want to check from the right. So if I am um, coming from x's that are to the right of 4, so they're greater than 4 but close to 4, I could start with values like 5 and get closer and closer. All of these values are greater than 1, so all of these qualify for negative x plus 3. All right, so that means I'm going to be plugging those values into that function, negative x plus 3, and I will end up with negative 2, negative 1.5, negative 1.1, 1.01, negative 1.001, negative 1.0001. 
And so as we come towards an x of 4, our y's are getting closer and closer to negative 1. And so we already had an answer of negative 1 here. We're now going to have an answer of negative 1 here as well. Notice that um, when we are coming from the left, we were getting close to negative 1 and we happened to be you know, on the 0.99 side. Now we're slightly you know, on the other side of it, the negative 1.01 side, but both are heading towards negative 1. So graphically, what we would be doing is coming from the right, um, so tracing our graph where x's are greater than 4 and getting closer and closer and simply asking what y are we getting close to? And we're getting close to negative 1. So we got the left limit to be negative 1, we got the right limit to be negative 1, and what our theorem said is if the left and the right limits are equal, then that is the answer to the regular limit without any superscript. So just limit as x approaches 4 with no little plus or minus there, means from those sides. So here, unlike the other problem where we got does not exist, because the two equaled each other, we actually got an answer there. All right. So that is the idea of a limit. It is not about what's happening at the point. Um, it is about what's happening um, near that point. And let's see, if we go back to this slide, I actually want to do a little additional question here. So the limit as x approached 1 did not exist. If I asked you instead, what is f of 1? This is back to pre-calculus. This is before we knew anything about limits. And we had an open circle here and a closed circle there. So whenever you had a choice, you have to go with the filled-in circle. So if you're asked for a function value, you're looking for the filled-in circle, if there is one. There may not be, but here there is. And we are literally going right down on that point. And right down on that point, our answer is 2. So the function value existed and was 2, but the limit did not exist. Now back to the example that we just did. If I ask you what, oh, I guess it's g, sorry, g of uh, 4, and it would have been g over there too. Um, g of 4, here, there is only one spot. And so that's going to be a big difference between the last problem and this problem is that we were in a different part of the graph. So here, if I go right down when x equals 4, I get negative 1. So notice in this example, it just so happens that the function value... So this is from pre-calc, the function value and the limit value were the same. Whereas on the last example, they weren't. So on the last example, um, the limit didn't exist, but we still had a function value. So what happened there? What's the difference? Well, at a very basic level, there was clearly something weird happening at 1, right? 1 was our changing point of which function we use, and visually there was a clearly a jump there. Um, whereas at x equals 4, if I zoom in and ignore, you know, just look right around that point, uh, it's just a normal looking part of the graph. And so it makes sense that that limit value and that function value matched up there. Okay, at this time, I would like you to pause your video and go to your notes that you've printed to go along with this and you try. So try this example. And we have a new function, and we're checking from the left and from the right. You can use the table as a way to see it and plug in the values and see what you get. Um, and then verify by tracing the graph. Okay? And then you know that I've got the answers for you to check posted as well on the filled in. But you really have to do math in order to learn it. Just watching is not going to work, because guess what? You can't watch when you're taking the test by yourself, right? So pause it now and try this example and we'll come back to the next example. Okay, so we're gonna do one more together, and I wanted to make sure to show you kind of the other kind of piecewise function that we often see. So those two um, functions had where you use one part for like half the graph up until a certain value and use the other part for the rest of the graph. Well, here you use one function the entire time except one spot. Um, so you use x minus 2 everywhere except when x is 5. When x is 5, y is 6. End of story. So this one looks a little bit different. It's not going to have that half and half look to it. And I just want to make sure we had seen one of these as well. So if we use our table one more time, and we know that to find the limit as x approaches 5, we actually have to check from the left, from the right, and see if they equal. 
So as we look from the left, if we want to come from x's that are less than four, uh, less than five, um, but close to five, we could use four and they get closer and closer to five, like this. Well, look at all these values. If they are not five, which they're not, then we use x minus two. All right, so we use x minus two for any value that's not five, and none of those are five, because this is close to five, not at five. So if x is four, then we get two. If x is 4.5, we get 2.5, and then 2.9, 2.99, 2.999. So you should be getting used to this now. As x gets closer and closer to five, what is y getting closer and closer to? and it's heading towards three. Graphically, let's give it a shot. We would trace this graph from x's that are less than five heading towards five. And as we get really, really close to an x of five, our y is getting close to three. So remember, I don't care about an open circle because a limit says, what are you getting close to? What are you approaching? And you are clearly approaching three. So our answer to the limit from the left, whether you do it with a table or whether you're getting away from having to use a table and just tracing it, our answer is three. So now if I take the limit as x approaches five from the right, remember, I'm plugging in x's that are greater than five but getting closer and closer to five, and here's some examples. Well, none of those is five. And so if it's not five, then we use that x minus two. And so these are the values that I'm plugging into x minus 2, and I will get 4 and 3.5, oops, 3.1, 3.01, 3.001, 1. okay? As x gets closer and closer to 5, my y's are getting closer and closer to 3, and now I can look at it graphically as well. So I want to trace my graph coming from where on that graph x's are greater than 5 and get closer and closer to an x value of 5 and ask myself, what are we approaching? Well, the y value that we're approaching is indeed 3. So in this case, the limit from the left was 3, the limit from the right was 3, and so our answer is that the limit is 3. Now at the very bottom of the screen down there, maybe it's not even quite showing for you, sorry, um, it says, what is f of 5? So what is f of 5? And this one really is f, not g, okay? Now f of 5 is the function value. f of 5 is if I put my pencil right down on it, not all this tracing stuff we're talking about. So if I go put my pen right down on it, I cannot go there because it's an open circle. When x is exactly 5, the answer is 6. It tells me that. And that's this filled in circle. So for a function value, we have to look for the filled in circle. And so our limit value was 3 because as we came from both the left and the right, we were heading towards this open circle of 3. Um, but our function value has to be the filled in circle where we really do have a point defined, and it is 6. So this is going to lead to the idea of continuity, which we will get to um, in a couple sections, where we need to compare the function value to the limit value, and whether or not those equal will help us determine continuity. So now we've seen um, a limit problem where we kind of have like one function and another, and they don't meet up. And now we've seen another where it's pretty much just one function, but then there's a hole, and maybe that point is located somewhere else. All right. So we're going to um, use our understanding of doing limits um, by tracing or numerically to kind of be able to step away from that entirely and be able to take limits algebraically, meaning we don't have to have a picture of a graph at all. But we're going to use what we just learned as a segue to get there. So this is the graph y equals x. And the question is, as x approaches negative 1, right, the limit as x approaches negative 1 on this function. Well, we know we have to trace from the left and from the right. And in both cases, as x approaches negative 1, our y is getting closer and closer to um, negative 1 as well. 
And that should make sense to us because y equals x, right? The function is y equals x. So whatever x is getting close to, so is y. And that's going to um, come up again and be very important. I, this is a different function, so we're just getting lots of practice of what we just learned. This is the function y equals 3, right? g of x equals 3. And I'm again approaching negative 1, but it's a different function. So that's why it's important that we say the limit as x approaches negative 1 you know, of what? All right, and so um, if we trace this as we head from the left and right towards an x value of negative 1, no matter what x value we're approaching, we're always getting a y value of 3. Because 3 is the only defined function. You know, it's a horizontal line. It's y equals 3. So no matter what x we're approaching, our answer is 3. Okay? And so then this last function, one more practice. We're still approaching negative 1. So as I trace from the left and as I trace from the right, um, what y value are we approaching? So as x gets closer and closer to negative 1 from both sides, um, it turns out that, what are we heading to? Um, that our y is approaching 2. So I got a little bit high there. There we go. Okay? And so that's just practicing doing things graphically, just tracing and checking it out. And you can do it on your own paper um, where you can see the images a little bit better. So these three functions weren't just chosen at random. These three functions were chosen for a reason. So notice that capital F of X is actually the sum of little f and little g. So um, capital F of X is X plus 3. And f of x was x, and g of x was 3. So this was done on purpose, okay, that um, this function is the sum of the other two. And what we'd like to know is if we're approaching the same x value, if I add a bunch of limit signs, is this still true? So is it true um, that the limit as x approaches negative 1 of, f of capital F of x is equal to the limit as x approaches negative 1 of these? Well, notice that the limit um, as x approaches negative 1 of x was negative 1. And the limit as x approaches negative 1 of g was 3. And if we add those, we do get 2. So this is by no means a proof, but it's just an example to show you um, that if I take the limit of each piece and then add them, I get the same answer um, as if I had added the values and then taken the limit. And that gets us into these, what I call limit laws, because I like the alliteration of it. Um, so just so you know, before I talk about these, you do not have to cite numbers of limit laws for me. So if you use a different textbook, they'd be in a different order and they'd have a different number. So that'd just be silly. So I do not need to know that this is limit law number three or limit law number seven. It's just there so we can you know, refer to them now. We just have to know the spirit of them and be able to apply them, but we don't have to know what number they are. So we have two different functions here, f and g, but we're approaching the same value, c. So remember, c is some number that x is getting closer and closer to, like 2 or, well, here, negative 1. Um, and the answer to, to the limit for f is l, and the answer to the limit for um, g is m. So these are our, our limit laws, um, and these two are going to be particularly important, and we've already seen them up here. So the first one says k is a completely different constant, okay? So the first one says if limit, um, the limit as x approaches c of k, well, that's like this function, where the only y value was 3, so 3 is like our k here, then no matter what x you're approaching, y is always 3. So if you're tracing on a constant function, no matter what x is approaching, y is always approaching that constant. So the limit of a constant is that constant. The limit as x approaches negative 1 of the constant function 3 was 3. Okay? That's going to be a big one. The other one we saw in the top left graph. So the limit as x approaches some number on the function y equals x, right there, um, is whatever you were approaching. And we saw that. The limit as x approaches negative 1 on y equals x was negative 1. Okay? So why is that? Well, y equals x, so whatever x is getting close to, y is getting close to the same value. So our goal is going to be to apply all these other limit laws 
so that we can get down to where we're only using these two. Because these two make sense. We can see them in these two examples um, and, and get down to where we just know an answer. Because notice both of these have number answers that we know, that either the constant function you were given or the value you're approaching. So number three is an example of what we showed up here, that if you need to take the limit of something that can be thought of as a sum of two other functions, like exactly like we saw here, it turns out we could take the limit of each one individually and then add their answers. And that's what we saw. So if we took the limit of each one individually and got negative one and three and added their answers, we get the same answer as if we just took the limit of that function, which we had done graphically. So we, we verified it and know it's true. Um, number four is really not much different. It's just what if it was subtraction instead of addition, okay? And then number five says if there's a constant times your function, you can bring that constant out in front, take the limit of the simpler part of the function, and then multiply the results. And we'll see these in action in a second. Um, the, the sixth one there says if you have two things that are multiplied together, you could take the limit of each piece and then multiply them. So you see a running theme here um, with addition, subtraction, multiplication. Division as well, as long as you don't divide by zero, you know you always have to put that little caveat in there that we can't divide by zero. So that if you have the limit of a fraction, it's the limit of the, the numerator divided by the limit of the denominator, um, but you just have to make sure the denominator is not zero. And then um, the eighth one there is talking about a root, and actually I'd like to add a ninth, um, that if we have the limit of x to the n, then we can um, take the limit inside and then raise it to the n. And actually, this is the broader case. It bothers me that, that your book did this, but um, this is the broader case um, there. And remember that um, an nth root is a power, right? It's a one over power. So that's actually a special case of this, of this uh, rule here. So again, it's always just um, taking that limit to the simpler part and then doing the operation. So taking the limits of each little piece and then adding or, and then subtracting or multiplying or dividing. Here, it's taking the limit of the simpler function um, and then applying the power or and then applying the root down there. So I, I know that looks like a lot, um, we are not going to have to use that very much in practice, but it's really, really important because it turns out that um, where we're heading is to derivatives and integrals. Those are the two halves of calculus, and um, all of the derivative rules and all of the integral rules actually relate back to these limit laws. They all come from here. Why? Because it turns out that a derivative and an integral are actually defined by limits. So don't, don't worry. I'll show you as we go on that you're not going to have to recite this to me much, but we need to know they exist and we need to understand the spirit of them. So here is the one and only example where we're actually going to show every single limit law to observe some patterns and not have to do it anymore. All right, so it says use the limit laws to find this limit. So notice there's no graph, I'm not tracing, there's no table of values, I'm not plugging in values and seeing what it's getting close to. I am doing this algebraically. Okay, so when on a, a test I ask you to do it algebraically, uh, well, actually you won't even have to show this much work. I'll show you what it'll look like in a second. Okay, so if we're actually going to apply the limit laws, we had one limit law that said if you have things added, well, two laws, if you have things added and subtracted together, that you can take the limit of each piece and then evaluate it. So that's the first step is we're going to do the limit as x approaches 5 of the first term minus the limit as x approaches 5 of the second term um, plus the limit as x approaches 5 of the last term. Let's see, let me get this a little thinner, see if that's better. All right, so um, that was, uh, and I, let's see, let me see which ones it was. That was rules three and four, right? That if you had things added or subtracted together, you could put the limit sign with each one. That's what we did. Okay, now, um, this is already the last term, limit as x approaches five of nine. 
already looks like one of the two starred ones that I said is our goal. Those are what we're trying to break this down to. So we're good there. Um, but the, oops, the first term has a power in it. And that was actually the kind of add-on rule I, I wrote for you that they forgot for some reason. And that said that I can put the limit inside with the x and then raise it to a power. And then the middle term has a constant multiplied by it. That's number five again, not because you have to tell me it's number five, but so you, that you can look at your list and see that I'm talking about number five. Um, so it has six times a function. And what this rule says is that you can put the limit inside with the part that matters, the part that has x's in it, and leave the six outside. And that's what we're doing now. So minus six times the limit uh, as x approaches five of x. And then we said this one we were already good on. And I'll put some parentheses here. Okay. So I said that we want to get everything to either be the limit of a constant or the limit of x because we know the answers to those. So this is like if you had the function y equals x and you were tracing it as x gets closer to, closer to 5, well, y equals x. So y is whatever x is. So if x is getting closer and closer to 5, so is y. And, and again, that rules on the previous page, that the limit as x approaches 5 of x is 5. But remember, we have that exponent, that power of 2 there. All right, minus 6 times, well, this is the same question. The answer hasn't changed. The limit as x approaches 5 of x is 5. And then the last one, the other starred um, number that we had over there, said the limit of a constant. So if you have a constant function, y equals 9, then no matter what x you're approaching, y is always 9. And so we saw that one um, as an example as well. So we wrote all those limit laws and talked about which ones we were using. But my question to you is, what does this look like we did? So if you didn't look at any of the other steps, and you just looked at this last step, it looks to me like we took this function and simply replaced all x's with the number 5. And so we did all this work and we talked about limit laws, but hey, couldn't I have just done that? And the answer is yes, actually you could have just done that. And so what do we get? We get, so 5 squared is 25 minus 30 plus 9. So we have negative 5 plus 9, so we have 4. Okay? So we used all the limit laws, but in the last step, it ended up looking like we just plugged in um, 5, 4, x. All right, so that's our conclusion, is it looks like all we did was plug in 5 for x. And so it turns out that for nice functions, that is actually all we're doing, and we can do that. Um, but then what about not nice functions? We have to see in a minute. So this says for any polynomial function, this is a polynomial, um, it's got domains of all real numbers. So for any polynomial function, um, if you're trying to find the limit as x approaches a of that function, you're actually going to get the same answer if you just plug in, if you just replace x's with the value a. For a rational function, where we could have division by zero issues, the a has to be in the domain of the function. And so we're going to have to talk more about that, right? And so if a is in the domain of the function, then we can just substitute as well. But then the question is, what if it's not? Okay, and so um, down here, now I want to show you an example of what you can show me. So you do need to show me some work, but you don't have to show me this work. So is zero in the domain of this function? In other words, does it cause any issues? Well, when we talk about issues, domain issues, um, the only two things we're looking out for are division by zero and roots of negative numbers. Well, there is no division, so there's clearly no division by zero. There is a root, so let's do a little check. If I plug 0 in, do I have a negative number in the root? No, I don't. If I plug um, 0 in, I have 6 in the root, and that's fine. So yes, 0 is in the domain of the function, and if 0 is in the domain of the function, then we just plug in. So we have 0 squared minus 5 times 0 plus 6, and 
we get 6, right? 0 minus 0 plus 6. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's under the root. Oh, goodness. Okay. All right. So, so we had a square root there, and we were plugging in, and then um, this is 0, that's 0, and we still had the 6, and so our answer is the square root of 6. So you didn't have to show me the rule where you put the limit inside the radical, and you didn't have to show me the rule where the limit with, went with each sum and difference, and where it went inside the squared, and where the 5 came out. That's what we did up here, but this is all you really do have to show me. So show me that you're plugging in and what your answer is. And so as x approaches 0 on this function, the answer is the square root of 6. Okay? And then um, the example down here in the bottom is a u try, and so we have x squared over x squared plus 1, and you're seeing what happens as um, x approaches negative 2. As long as plugging x equals negative 2 um, into that function does not cause division by 0, it doesn't, um, then you just plug in. So all you're doing is plugging that in. So I would like you to take a second, pause the video, and give um, that u try example. So what you should have done down here in this u try example is simply replace x's with negative 2, and you get 4 fifths, because we have to be careful with our squaring of negative numbers. That's all your work should look like. So, yes, I want to see work, but you're simply plugging in when you can, when it's a nice function. Okay, so then the question is, what if A is not in the domain? You said, oh, if A is in the domain and it's a nice function, then you get to just plug in. I like that, but what if A is not in the domain? So, if we try to plug in, we would have negative 2 squared minus 4 over negative 2 plus 2. Well, that's 4 minus 4 over negative 2 plus 2. So there's a 0 in the bottom, but it's really important that there's actually also a 0 in the top. So this is something that you most likely have never seen before. You've talked about what if there's a 0 in the top and something other than 0, like 5 in the bottom. You've talked about if there's a number like 7 in the top and there's a 0 in the bottom, that that's undefined. But this is 0 over 0. And this is called indeterminate. Okay? So that's, that's a new idea that you most likely have never seen in pre-calculus. It is truly indeterminate. The reason it has that name is when we actually work this out, which I'm going to show you how to do in a second, maybe the answer does end up being 0, and it's kind of like the top 1. Or maybe the answer ends up being undefined, because it's kind of like the bottom, that division by 0, 1. Or maybe the answer is like 7. So the answer could just be some number. Um, it's not a random number. It depends on the function. But to us, it might seem kind of random. So it is truly indeterminate, because um, you can get 0 over 0 as an initial answer. It is not an allowable final answer um, to a lot of different functions. But when you actually evaluate it, you can get all different answers. So it truly is indeterminate. So this is not a final answer. All right, I'll throw a point at you if you tell me that you realize it is indeterminate but we, we have to keep going. All the rest of our points are going to be by actually working this out. So what do we do? All right, what we do, that indeterminate is going to be um, an indicator to us that we should use algebra. Well, that seems kind of generic, right? Use algebra. But it depends on the problem, what algebra you're going to use. So when you look at this and you channel your algebra class, what's just jumping out at you that you should do? And if I look at that, it's begging me to factor it. And that's not just because I'm a math professor. If you admit it, all right, it's begging you to factor it too. So um, what kind of factoring can we do? So in this case, that algebra is factoring. All right, well, the top factors as a difference of squares, right? There's a perfect square in the front, there's a perfect square in the back. So we get two sets of parentheses, and we put what's being squared in the front, in the fronts, and we put what is being squared to get four 
um, in the backs, and then one's a plus and one's a minus. Okay, so remember that only works when there is a difference, a subtraction in between there. And then our denominator was x plus 2. Well, remember, we're near negative 2. We're not at negative 2. And that is why it's actually OK for me to do this. So we are um, canceling. I guess I should do that. All right, so we're canceling those terms and then saying that what we're left with. So when that cancels, it leaves a 1 in the bottom that I don't really need to write. And um, all we then have is the limit as x approaches negative 2 of x minus 2. Now, if we plug in, we no longer get an indeterminate form. And so that's what we do. So we use some sort of algebra, in this case it was factoring, until we get it to a form where you no longer get an indeterminate form when you try to just plug in, that nice easy way that we learned. So now if I replace x with negative 2, I get negative 4. And so if you just glanced at that, you probably wouldn't have seen that coming um, from the beginning. And that's why this truly is indeterminate. Um, we could see another example where it ends up being 0 or, or undefined um, or some completely different number. So make sure that you can do an example um, where you just get to plug in, like the last couple of examples, um, and one where you have to use algebra. So I promise you that on your test and eventually your final exam, um, when we are working on, um, when we're testing algebraic limits, you will have one example where you get to just plug in and one example where you're going to get an indeterminate form and have to know that you need to do algebra um, and to simplify the function until when you do take the limit by replacing um, x with negative 2, you no longer get an indeterminate form. So there's a, a couple things there that we need to start being really careful about. Notice that while I was doing this algebra, the limit sign was still there. It is mathematically false for this limit sign to just appear and disappear. It really matters that we're talking about when you get close to negative 2, not when you're at negative 2. Um, so we need to make sure that this limit sign stays the whole time. And then when you replace x with negative 2, that is you taking the limit. And so then the limit sign is gone. So think about something really basic, um, like 5 times 6. Okay. Well, the multiplication sign is an operator. It's telling you to do something. So when you do 5 times 6, and you get your answer of 30, you don't write the time sign anymore. You don't write the multiplication sign anymore because you did what it asked. Well, that's how the limit sign works too. It is also an operator of sorts. And so the limit as x approaches negative 2 of x minus 2, when you replace negative 2, um, replace x with negative 2, that is you taking the limit. You did what the symbol asked you to do, so now the symbol is gone. You did what the symbol asked you to do, so now the symbol is gone, right? So it's the same idea, even though limits might be more foreign to you than a multiplication sign. It's actually the same idea. So make sure that limit sign stays until you take the limit by replacing um, the x value with the value you're approaching, and then the limit sign is gone after that. Okay, so um, we kind of step it up a little bit when we get into absolute value functions. And so uh, all, all of us know what an absolute value function does. We say, if you were trying to explain to an elementary schooler what absolute value is, you would say it makes things positive. And that is true, but that is not what you'll find in textbooks, right? There's, there's a real definition there. And we need to recognize that absolute value is actually a piecewise function in order to properly answer this question um, because we, we know that when we are at a place on the graph where weird things are happening, we have to check from the left and right and make sure they're the same thing before we can say what the limit is. And so what is the formal definition of an absolute value function? Well, there's two cases. It makes things positive, right? Well, absolute value of 3 is 3. I got the same thing that I put into it, and that's because what I put into it was already positive. Also, the absolute value of 0 is 0, so it also doesn't change. So we end up with one of these piecewise functions. If what you put into it is already positive or zero, then you get out the same thing you put into it. 
like I said, absolute value of three, absolute value of three is three. You get the same thing. Um, if what you put into it is negative, then you get out the opposite. So if I take the absolute value of negative five, my answer is not negative five. It's the opposite of negative five, right? It's negative, negative five. It's positive five. So that might look way more complicated than just saying it makes things positive, but that really are, that, that shows the two cases. So if x is positive or zero, then the absolute value is whatever you put into it. But if you plug a negative number into an absolute value, then you're getting out the opposite. You're getting the positive version of that number out, okay? So we need to know this so that we can check from the left and from the right. So if we're checking the limit um, from the left, right, that notation of the absolute value of x, we have to decide which piece we're using. Well, if we're to the left of zero, we are less than zero, and so we're actually using that piece of the function. So what I'm doing here um, is showing which part. We are using. All right. So what is the original problem was the absolute value of x, but the absolute value of x is defined by two pieces, and so I'm showing which piece I'm actually using. And then once I've done that, I'm ready to try to just take the limit. Well, the little minus sign does not affect the fact that we just plug in. The minus sign is what told me to use the negative x versus the positive x. We already did that part. Um, so we keep it there to, to be consistent, but we really are just plugging in zero. So remember, once I plug in, there was a negative and a, a x, so I've got that um, negative and my x is zero, but negative zero is zero, right? Um, so once I plug in, limit sign's gone, right? I did what, limit, what, the, what the symbol asked me to do. So we have now done the limit from the left. Now we're going to do the limit from the right. So if I want to do the limit from the right of absolute value of x, I have to decide which piece I'm using. Well, if I'm coming from x's that are great, um, to the right of 0, then that is x's that are greater than 0. So now I am using this piece, the positive x piece. And that's what the plus told me was which piece I should be using. After that, it's back to kind of a normal problem. So I take the limit by replacing x with my number. Again, the superscript doesn't matter. That just told me which piece to use. It was important, but it doesn't matter for this step. Um, it's just the zero that I'm plugging in. So in this case, um, my left limit was zero, and my right limit is also zero. Those two things equal each other. And so since the limit from the left and the limit from the right equal each other, we can now answer the original question that the limit as x approaches zero of absolute value of x is zero. So you might be wondering why on this problem I did the whole left and right thing and on the last few I didn't. Again, it's all about um, if, if you're in a nice part of the function um, where you're doing the same thing on both sides. And in our others, they were polynomials where we were doing the same thing on both sides. And here um, it did break down to a piecewise function. So um, if you actually graph the absolute value graph, um, you can see if you were tracing it from the left or from the right, you would be heading towards zero. So both the left and the right limit give you zero. So it does match up with our understanding of taking these limits um, graphically as well. Okay, so our, that is the answer to our limit. So we were looking at that one um, because this one is a little bit trickier and we wanted to have kind of the base example to go on there. Let's see if it will. Well, that'll work. Okay, so, um, well, that makes sense. Okay, so this time um, our function's a little bit more complicated. Now, we don't have to make a piecewise function out of the whole thing. We just need to make a piecewise function um, out of the part that has an absolute value with it. So I do green now. All right, so we just we need to look at our previous one to kind of see why this makes sense. So how do we define the absolute value of x minus three? 
it's going to also be uh, a piecewise function, just like um, the last one. It's just a slightly more complicated piecewise function. So we're going to make some comparisons there. Okay. So remember, it's not about whether x is positive or negative. It's about whether the thing you're taking the absolute value of is positive or negative. And that's really important. And a lot of students kind of glaze over that, but, but it matters. Um, so if I plug in um, 2, that's a positive number. But what I'm actually taking the absolute value of is 2 minus 3, or negative 1. So by the time I get to the absolute value part, absolute value of negative 1, right, I, I need to make it a positive um, of that. So instead of it hinging on whether x is positive or negative, it hinges on whether the thing that you are taking the absolute value of is positive or negative. And so it matters if x minus 3 is greater than or equal to 0 or if x minus 3 is less than 0. Okay, and now you're not used to seeing um, piecewise functions look like that, and we'll fix it up, but that's the starting point. Just start with what you know and get there. Don't think you're supposed to know everything from the beginning. So if what you're taking the absolute value of is positive or zero, then you get out what you put in it. If what you're taking the absolute value of is negative, then you get out the opposite. So if you kind of just take a deep breath and slow down and look, um, it really does match up with what we have over here. Um, it's just that there's something more complicated than just an x inside, and so these look more complicated too. Um, but how we normally see this, if we add 3 over, that's how you would normally see your conditions. And then if I add 3 over here, right, so it actually ends up depending on whether x is greater than or equal to 3 or x is less than 3. Um, not whether x is positive or negative, because we do something to x before we take the absolute values. Okay, so once we have our piecewise function, we're ready to do the left limit and the right limit, just like we did before. So if we want to do the limit as x approaches 3 from the left, All right, so the 3 minus x part isn't affected, um, but the absolute value, we have to decide which piece we're using. And so here, we are coming from the left of 3. That means we are less than 3. And so we're actually using that bottom piece. And so that's what the negative um, notation told me there, was that I need to use that piece of the function. So once I've done that, I, if I tried to plug in right now, I'd get 3 minus 3, which is 0, over negative 3 minus 3, which is negative 0. I'd get 0 over 0, which is indeterminate. So I can't plug in yet. I need to do some simplifying first. I need to use algebra, like we talked about. So here, the algebra that we do is pretty basic. All right, so if I just distribute that negative, I'll have negative x plus 3. And if I rearrange that, that is 3 minus x. I should always have my limit sign. All right, well, 3 minus x over 3 minus x, if I try to plug in, I will again get uh, 0 over 0, which is not good. But if instead I cancel and see that it leaves a 1 there, let's see, so we've got... The limit as, looks like it got big on me again. That is one of our limit laws that we know. So the limit of a constant is that constant. All right, and that is the answer to our limit from the left. So now if we go and look at the limit from the right, So the limit as x approaches 3 from the right, all right, which piece are we using? Well, if we're to the right of 3, we're greater than 3, 
And when we're greater than 3, we use x minus 3, regular x minus 3. Okay, if you tried to plug in to take the limit, you would get 0 over 0. So we have to do some algebra. And here, um, we can do kind of some factoring. So if we bring a negative out, So if I factor a negative out, I'll have negative 3 plus x, and down here I had x minus 3, and we run into a similar situation of what we just had. All right, so that's a negative, and then I could rewrite that as x minus 3. And down here I have x minus 3, and I can cancel. And when I cancel, that leaves um, that negative 1 this time. And we know that the limit of a constant is that constant. So here we get negative 1. All right. So this limit uh, does not exist. Why does it not exist, right? Well, we checked the limit from the left, and we got positive 1. We checked the limit from the right, and we got negative 1. Those two don't equal each other, and when the left and right don't match up, then we say the limit does not exist. So I wanted to make sure to show you one of those. That's about as bad as it gets. So I did have to recognize that an absolute value is actually defined as a piecewise function. I did then have to check from the left and the right using the appropriate piece of the function, um, recognize that I was getting indeterminate form, so doing some algebra to simplify, and then getting my answers to verify. Okay, so come back to this one if there's anything. Um, I always try to make sure that I have examples at the level of the homework or harder so that you have something to reference and you know you can tackle anything from here. All right, we're getting close. Um, so here are some examples. I would love for you to pause the video and try these on your own. What you're going to see is a variety of cases here. Okay, so pause it now and then we'll come back and talk about it. All right, I hope you really did pause it. I hope you really did try them. So here, um, what we always want to try the easiest thing first. Okay, so um, if you can just plug in, you just plug in. If you plug in and you get 0 over 0 indeterminate, then you do more work. But don't start by trying to do more work, right? So if I can just plug in, then I do. All right, so 2 minus 2 is 0, and 2 squared is 4, and that is a plus 4, and that's important. This is not indeterminate. This is a number. What number is this? It's 0. Right? Zero divided by a non-zero number is zero. And that is actually the answer to this question. Okay? So you always try to just plug in and just get your answer. Not bad. The limit sign was gone right from the get-go because I plugged in, which is me taking the limit, um, right from the get-go. Okay? Now if we look at B. So if I try to plug in, I get 2 minus 2 over 2 squared minus 4, which is 0 over 4 minus 4 this time, which is 0 over 0. That is not a final answer. Do not write that as your answer. This could be your, oh, it is indeterminate, okay? So that is indeterminate and means use algebra, okay? Well, what kind of algebra? Again, that's just begging to be uh, factored, right? So limit as x approaches 2 of x minus 2 over, and that factors as the difference of squares, x plus 2, x minus 2. And so then we cancel, and um, I see a lot of algebra errors here. x plus 2 lived in the bottom, and it still does. What is, what is left when we cancel is a 1 in the top, okay? So a lot of times I get an answer of 4 for this when the answer is in fact 1 fourth. Okay, so this is what we have after we cancel. There's a 1 up there, 
Now, if I replace um, x with 2, I will no longer have an indeterminate form. So now that I am plugging in, limit sign is gone because I did what it asked. This is how, when x is in the domain, I take a limit of a function and I get 1 fourth. Okay? So in um, part A, I got to just plug in and get a number, although I do need to be careful that I understand what numbers I get with where my zero lives. In B, I got zero over zero, and that matters. That's different than zero over a non-zero. Zero over zero is indeterminate. I had to do some algebra, but once I did, I no longer got indeterminate when I plugged in. I got an answer. Okay, and then our last one. So here, if we try to plug in, always try to plug in first. Do the easiest thing first. Then, if there's an issue, you figure it out. All right, so 4 over 4 minus 4, 4 over 0, and that is a different case. So you can see these are chosen on purpose to make sure we remember um, 0 divided by a non-zero is 0. Okay, so if I have zero cookies to share amongst eight people, how many does each of the eight people get? They each get zero, okay? Here, this is taking um, a group of four people and trying to divide them into zero groups. So think about that for a minute. So if they all stay together, that's one group. If they all go separate, that's four separate groups. If they go in pairs, that's two groups, right? There is no way to take four people and put them in zero groups. And then my students usually say, oh, if they leave the building. Well, then they're one group outside of the building, but they're still a group. Or they're four individuals outside of the building. They're still four groups. All right? So that is truly undefined. So you've learned this before, but this is the first time we're seeing indeterminate and undefined right beside each other. And I want to make sure that we see that. So notice all three of these cases have zeros involved when we plug in, but they're all three different cases. So first we had zero over a non-zero, that is zero. And then we had zero over zero, that is indeterminate. It is not an acceptable final answer. It means use algebra and then you get an answer um, that happened to be one-fourth for that problem. And then in the last case, it was division by zero, a non-zero divided by zero, and that is undefined. And so if we get an undefined answer, you, know, you could write undefined for me, or you could say D and E. So I, I would accept either of those. And of course, in your homework system, just whatever notation they're using for that problem. Okay, I hope you tried it on your own before you watched me, because again, you really have to do math to learn it. Okay, so this is um, another example. We looked at problems like this when we had graphs. I can now ask you to do this without a graph. And we, we know now when you're talking about the left, we decide which piece we're using. When we're talking about the right, then we have to parts A and part B help me answer part C, right? And then we can compare to the function value. So for part A, if I am approaching X from the left, Right? That means that we have numbers that are less than 5, and that means that we should use that part of the function when x is less than 5. So the limit as x approaches 5 from the left, we are going to use 2x plus 3. Okay, so we have 2 times 5 plus 3. I am plugging in. That is me algebraically taking the limit, so the limit sign is gone and I get 13. All right, now we're going to do the limit from the right. So if I'm coming from, um, to, from the right of 5, that is numbers that are greater than 5, and so I'm going to use the negative x plus 12 part. All right, so we have negative 5 plus 12, and that is 7. Okay, so now when we go to answer part C, part A and part B actually already answered it for me. So since these two were not the same, then this limit does not exist. And so that was because the limit from the left it always has to have of something, because again, if this is G equals 72, it's a different answer. So the limit as x approaches 5 of which function? This function. All right, 
was not equal to the limit as x approached 5 from the right of that function. Okay? That's why it does not exist. So the answer is that it does not exist. Now, what would the function value be? Well, this was not a typo. Normally, you see a or equal to underneath one of those. And what we're normally looking at for a function value is the or equal to, and that's the one we go with. But there is none. So what this means, um, and of course, this is not at all what it looks like, but you're using something, and then there's just a hole, and then you are... Um, using something else. Let's see, so we were at 13 from the left and 7 from the right. And so there's holes in both places. And there is no filled in circle to default to. So this function is literally not defined for um, the value of x equals 5. All right. So sometimes you can have the limit exist and not the function value. The function value exists and not the limit. Or maybe nothing um, ends up existing in this case. But the left limit and the right limit by themselves exist. Um, it's just that they aren't equal, so the two-sided limit does not exist. All right? So that's how we can look at problems very similar to what we opened this section with and not need a graph to do them now that we know how to take limits algebraically. Okay, so here's one more. I would love for you to try this. Be careful because notice what's different about it. So pause your video and try this example where um, limit is h approaches 0 of 2x squared plus 2xh plus h squared. All right, give it a shot. Okay, I hope you really tried it. So what's different about this? Hopefully you noticed all the other problems have been x approaches 0. Here it's h approaches 0, and that matters. So there's x's and h's floating around in this problem. It is the h that is being affected by this limit. It is the h that needs to be replaced with 0 here. So remember that whenever we can just plug in, we do. But what are we plugging in for? We are plugging in 0 for h, not for x, because it's h approaching 0. And that's going to be really important when we get into this um, down the road a lot more. So 2x, the h is what is 0, the h is what is 0, okay? So that's 2x squared. This, of course, 2x, 2 times x times 0 is just 0, and 0 squared is 0, so we really just got 2x squared. Okay, so again, limit sign was gone right away because us plugging in 0 for h um, is us taking the limit. So we don't need the limit sign anymore because we did what it asked. So we get just 2x squared. Okay, so notice then that this is also the limit as h approaches 0. And that's going to be, you don't know it yet, but this is actually the definition of the derivative, which is like what half of calculus is about. It's a real big deal, all right? But you have done everything except this limit sign before, in, in not probably not just pre-calc, but probably even Algebra 2 leading into pre-calc. And at the time, you were just doing it to practice function notation because we told you to. But we're actually going to be motivated soon and know why, uh, why we're using it. All right, so right now, we're just using it as a practice for a limit, but we're going to find out it's very, very important. So the first thing we need to do is actually plug into this template that we have here. So remember, f of x plus h means everywhere there had been an x in the problem before, you replace with x plus h. So this always seems to be something really difficult for students, and I'd like to show you that it's no different than me asking you for f of 2. So if I asked you for f of 2, unrelated to this particular problem, but just to lead to it, you would take your x and replace it with 2. If I asked you for f of negative 1, you can write out your function, but instead of an x, you are going to replace it with negative 1. So if I asked you to do something crazy, like f of smiley face, you might think I'm crazy, but you would write your function, and instead of x, you would write a smiley face. Okay, so for some reason, this x plus h really bothers students, and I think it's because it has an x in it, but it's not just x, and 
So if it's weird to you, then think about how weird smiley face was. And that if f of 2 means just replace x with 2, and f of smiley face means just replace x with smiley face, then f of x plus h just means replace x with x plus h. So whatever is in here in that function notation is what you replace x with, even if you think it looks weird, all right? So that often is actually the hardest part of this. The limit part doesn't end up actually being very hard. Um, so in some of your algebra review stuff, there's lots of practice with this, and I, I hope that you'll spend the time to do it. Okay, so we actually need this f of x plus h. So we have the limit as h, h approaches 0 of, okay, f of x plus h is 5 times x plus h uh, minus 7. All right, now that was f of x plus h. All right. So then there's a minus sign. I write a minus sign. Then it says f of x. Okay, well, I know what f of x is. It's right here. Now, this is not okay, what I wrote. Okay, it's not okay because I have to subtract off the entire quantity. So this is a biggie. This is going to be where we run into issues. Um, anytime you have multiple terms, you have to put that in parentheses. Okay, so just so you can see where the pieces came from, I have, this is my f of x plus h, then there's a minus sign, and then there's an f of x. So that's where those pieces come from, and then divided by h. All right, make that smaller again. Okay, so that is actually what students find to be the hardest part, and it really was in your pre-calc class. It's just practice with plugging in using function notation. The rest is going to be just algebra. So um, if you try to take the limit right now, remember taking the limit means replacing um, h with 0. If you actually did that, it's ugly, but you would get 0 over 0. So before, in pre-calc, you were told to simplify this using every piece of algebra you know just because I told you to. But there's actually a reason that we're going to keep simplifying, and, and that's because we would have an indeterminate form up to that point. And so we keep going until we wouldn't have an indeterminate form. So we're going to simplify. We have, um, we need to distribute at 5x plus 5h minus 7. I need to distribute here, minus 5x plus 7, and it's all over h. And notice that there are some things that can cancel here now. So we can cancel the 5x's. We can cancel the sevens, okay? Because they are opposite signs. If you forgot the parentheses and forgot to distribute, these would not cancel, and that would be a problem. So you don't want to cancel unless their signs are really different. If their signs aren't different, go back and find the error. Don't just try to glaze over it, okay? All right, so what we have now is the limit as h approaches 0 of 5h over h. If you try to take the limit right now by replacing h with 0, you would get 0 over 0. It's still indeterminate at all these steps. But there's an obvious step of algebra I can do here, all right? And so now I am just taking, let me come down. The limit of as h approaches 0 of the constant 5. And that was one of our two nice limits. The limit of a constant is that constant. Okay? So you don't know it, you didn't know it, but you actually just solved a derivative problem. Really, it was just pre-calculus function notation mixed with our new limit notation. And that's why we were doing it, to see that that indeterminate form business is what motivated all the simplifying that we did, okay? So definitely make sure that you go to your algebra pre-calc review and practice with this function notation because 
Um, as I've told you in introductory materials, algebra is the number one reason for struggling in calculus. Some of the, the biggest concepts in calculus, I could tell you and you could just move symbols around and do very easily. But then when you get into simplifying things, it's the algebra that comes back to haunt you. So really practice with this function notation, understanding um, that it is not f of x and then shove a plus h on the end. It is actually replacing all the x values with the quantity x plus h, meaning you're going to have some distributing to do. All right? So this was finding limits. Both, well, we've been through it all now. So we started finding them numerically with tables. And then at the same time, we looked at limits graphically. And we kind of used the tables to help us, to help support what we were seeing graphically. And then we wanted to wean ourselves off tables so that we can just do tracing to figure out limits. And now they're quite quick once you've practiced. Um, and then we use what we learned there to see how we can take a limit even if we don't have a graph to look at at all and, and not a table of values either. And that is that to take a limit algebraically, you simply replace the value, now in this case it was h, previously it had been x, um, with, with what you're approaching. And if you get a nice number or zero or undefined, then you're done. If you get zero over zero, which is an indeterminate form, we simply do a little bit of algebra, which for the most part was factoring and distributing stuff. Um, and then when it no longer would give us an indeterminate form, we plug in to get the answer. So try your homework now, and don't forget you can email me with questions anytime.